From 1300 to 1850, there wasn't a single recorded Muslim movement to Christ. Since then, there have been more than 90. This profound turnaround all started with an ex-Muslim named Sadra, who personally led 10 to 20,000 Muslims to Christ. This is his story. This video is part of a series on Muslim movements to Christ. That is, mass conversions of a thousand or more Muslims from a single ethno-linguistic group within two decades. Each video stands on its own, but a playlist can be found in the pinned comment in case you missed the introduction. Make sure you are subscribed to this channel to avoid missing any future episodes. In this video I'll be using several Indonesian and Javanese terms. My apologies if I botched some of the pronunciations. Christian missions in Indonesia began in the 16th century with the arrival of the Portuguese. On paper, these Catholic missionaries had good success, attracting 40,000 converts within a century. In reality, however, the number of true converts was far fewer, as many conversions were made for economic or political reasons. The Dutch arrived in the 17th century. The Dutch traders quickly drove out the Portuguese, beginning a long era of Dutch colonialism. Motivated primarily by economics, the government established an agreement with the local Muslim leaders whereby conversion from Islam was prohibited and missionaries were limited to contacting people adhering to traditional tribal religions. As a result, Christian churches were formed in parts of Indonesia where Muslims had little sway, but few were formed in Java. Like the Portuguese before them, the Dutch found good success on paper with more than 43,000 baptisms recorded by the late 18th century. However, they also found that the natives often converted for disingenuine reasons. The high number of rice Christians, as they were called, led missionaries to adopt a hardline stance whereby converts were expected to make a complete break with their culture, adopting European customs. The 19th century saw an expansion of missionary efforts and the first official efforts to evangelize Java. W. Huzu was among the first to arrive in central Java. A hardliner, he only attracted a handful of converts each year. He would, however, play an important role in the life of Sadra. While official missionaries struggled, lay efforts had better results. F. L. N. Thing, a lawyer by trade began training locals he worked with for native to native outreach. Financing most of the efforts himself, at least 50 people became evangelists under the unofficial Anthing Theological School. Most notable among the Javanese evangelists was Tangu Wulong. As a young adult, he was a guru in Yaomo, a type of religious leader, before coming in contact with Huzu, Anthing, and others. After becoming a Christian, he became a prolific evangelist, attracting more than 1,000 converts by the time of his death. It was in this environment of colonial rule and general hostility to the Christian religion that Sadra was born. Radin, as he was known at birth, was most likely born to a poor rural family in 1835. He was adopted by a wealthier family for the purpose of education, a common custom in 18th century Java. Radin attended Quran school from age 6 to 10. He did well and was given the opportunity to study under a Nigelmu, literally meaning knowledge, teacher by the name of Pak Kuraymin. After several years of studying under Kuraymin, Radin attended Pesintrin, a sort of secondary school where pupils were taught to exegete the Quran while living and working the land as a community. He adopted the name Abbas, becoming Radin Abbas, to show his connection with the Muslim community, and returned to St. Maren upon completion. Upon his return home, Radin discovered that his former teacher, Pak Kuraman, had become a Christian after being defeated in public debate by Tungul Wulong. Through Pak Kermain, Radin was introduced to Tungul Wulong and became interested in Christianity. Crucially, he learned that to become Christian did not mean to forsake one's Javanese identity. Radin then came in contact with Huzu. He moved out of the Kauman 
the exclusively Muslim section of town, and regularly walked five miles to attend Huzu's church. He was clearly very interested in Christianity by this time, but had not yet made a commitment to Christ. In 1866, Radin went to Batafia to meet Anthing. It was at this time that he made the decision to officially convert and be baptized, receiving the sacrament on April 14, 1867. In keeping with custom, he adopted a biblical name at baptism. He chose Sadra after Shadrach from the book of Daniel. What are your names, boys? I'm Shadrach. I'm Meshach. I'm Bubblebee, the Benny Boo. I'm Benny. Yes, that Shadrach. Well, it is not known exactly why he chose the name. It was a fitting choice. Just like his namesake, Sadrach would spend the rest of his life standing for God's truth in the face of a hostile culture while holding on to his ethnic identity. I want to pause from the story for a minute to point something out. Sadrach would go on to lead more than 10,000 Muslims to Christ, but that may have never happened if it was not for the work of others. Tungu Wulong helped lead more than 1,000 Muslims to Christ, but certainly none more significant for the kingdom than Sadrach. Anthing was instrumental in training Javanese evangelists, but brought few to Christ personally. Huzu, due to his hardline stance, helped convert no more than a couple hundred to Christ despite decades of work. Another fellow we haven't met yet, Pierre Turgens, led just 20 people to baptism in six years of full-time ministry before switching his focus towards translating the Bible into Javanese. This translation would prove instrumental in Sadrach's later conversion efforts. Most of us will never do anything close to what Sadrach did, but the point here is that we can all do something, and little things can have massive on-scene effects down the line. Back to our story. After his baptism, Sadrach joined the recently formed GIUZ, an organization formed by lay Christians who were frustrated by the official state church, the Indish Kirk's minimal desire to evangelize. Partnered with a Euro-Indonesian by the name of E.W. King, Sadrach's efforts helped bring substantial increases in the local Christian communities. Sadrach, however, left for his home region within a few years. There he joined up with Pat Kermain and Tungu Wulong and was introduced to several other Javanese evangelists who had started Christian communities. Less than a year later, he departed from his mentors to start his own ministry. Although several possible reasons for the break have been suggested, it seems clear on all accounts that a deep sense of missionary call was at the heart of the matter. Sadrach spent the next year in Pura, Asia, where he met Christina Stevens Phillips, Stephen Phillips was a Euro-Indonesian woman who had started a house church teaching the gospel to her servants. Her church quickly expanded and by the time she met Sadra was serving a couple dozen Javanese people. Sadra joined the church as an evangelist and soon began what would become his main technique for winning converts, public debate. In Javanese culture, religious gurus often challenged one another to public debate. The loser was honor-bound to convert to the other's position, and naturally, their pupils usually followed their defeated teacher. Sadrai used his extensive knowledge of both Islamic and Christian theology to win these debates. It seems that even simple peasants can see the obvious superiority of Christianity to Islam when the facts are laid out. After a year, Sadra moved to Karanjaza, where he established his first independent church in 1870. The first convert to his new church was Kiai Ibrahim, whom Sadra had defeated in public debate. Ibrahim would become one of Sadra's main helpers for much of his career. Kiai Kasa Menteram, a well-known guo, was converted next after a debate lasting multiple days. In his first year, Sadra won about a hundred converts and developed a reputation as a respected guru with a new Naumu. Although he taught all converts himself, he maintained a close relationship with Stevens Phillips. In 1871, the first church building was constructed, allowing local Sunday worship in Karanasa for the first time. The town soon became a hotspot for converts throughout the region to visit. 
By 1874, the church was booming with 2,500 people converted by Sadra and his followers, and five buildings across the region. Unfortunately, the Dutch missionaries grew to resent the new church rather than celebrate it, and they forbid their ministers from assisting the Javanese community. For a while, Stephen Phillips acted as an intercessor between the Dutch and Sadra. She fell ill, however, and died in 1876, leaving Sadra as the sole leader of the Javanese Christians. At this time, Sadra added Sura Pranata to his name, literally meaning one who has the courage to administer. The community continued to expand as the gospel was brought to town after town. By 1877, the church numbered around 5,000 people, across nearly 200 villages. This rapid expansion attracted the attention of the colonial government, who saw Sadra as a political threat. Although the government was legally obligated to remain neutral in religious matters, a plot was hatched to move leadership from Sadra to a Dutch missionary, P. Beeger. When he refused to comply, Sadra's enemies sought to have him removed under charges of disloyalty to the government. In 1882, the plotters got their chance when Sadra refused vaccination on religious grounds. Ironically, Biger also opposed vaccinations on religious grounds, but that didn't stop the plot. In March, Sadra was imprisoned and the leadership of the Javanese church handed over to Biger. After three weeks in prison and three months in house arrest, Sadra was cleared by the governor due to lack of evidence. Biger returned home to the Netherlands shortly thereafter, effectively ending the conflict. While he was in prison, a Dutch missionary named Jacob Wilhelm visited Sadra to get his side of the story. He became convinced of Sadra's innocence and the two became friends. In 1883, Sadra asked Wilhelm to become the minister of the Javanese church and he accepted giving the church access to an ordained minister for the first time since Stephen Phillips' death seven years prior. Thus turning the vaccination affair into a blessing for Sadra and his church. Shortly after Wilhelm's appointment, the church was officially named Yulan en Juan Christian Con Mardika, the group of free Christians. Wilhelm proved a productive partner. He helped maintain the church's freedom by reminding the colonial government of the right to freedom of religion, translated various materials into Javanese, and freed up Sadra for evangelism. The results were astonishing. The group of free Christians expanded from 3,000 members across 23 communities in 1883 to 5,600 members across 55 communities in 1888 to 6,800 members across 70 communities in 1890. Most converts were ex-Muslims, likely making Sadra's movement the largest from the foundation of Islam up until his day. The continued growth of the Javanese church again arose the suspicion of the Dutch missionaries, and an official investigation was conducted in 1891. Although Sadra was interviewed just once in the months-long investigation, the report concluded that he was a swindler using Christianity for material gain. The Missionary Society again tried to have Sadra removed, but about 98% of the church sided with him. Setback did happen in 1892, however, when Wilhelm fell ill and died. Sadra, now in his 60s, continued to grow the church by winning over Guru Ingelmus, who in turn taught their pupils. He was concerned, however, that the church lacked an ordained minister to administer the sacraments. L. Andrians was appointed by the Missionary Society to replace Wilhelm and proved to share similar sympathies for the Javanese as Wilhelm did. However, he was also afraid of synchronization and never became a full partner with Sadra. Partially as a result of the hesitancy of Adrians to cooperate, the Javanese church formed a relationship with the Apostolische Kirk, a church founded by Presbyterian minister Edward Irving. The Apostolische Kirk began as a revival movement seeking to worship like the first century church had. As such, it appointed apostles. In 1899, Sadra was ordained as the Apostle of Java, allowing him to administer the sacraments himself for the first time. The appointment also gave him official status with the government, 
greatly reducing the church's contact with the Dutch missionaries. Records for this final phase of Sadra's career are sketchy, since the Dutch missionaries no longer kept membership numbers for the community. However, surviving records of the church itself show annual baptisms topped 200, including over 500 in Sadra's final year. Sadra died on November 14, 1924, at an age of over 90 years. The community was estimated at 20,000 members at the time of his death. Upon his death, Sadra's adopted son, Yothe Marataja, took over leadership of the community. Schooled by missionaries, he doubted the authenticity of the office of apostle and was a hesitant leader. He considered bringing the church under Dutch control, but ultimately decided against it and accepted the position of apostle. He did, however, encourage more cooperation with the Dutch. Ten years later, the community split. Half followed Yotheim and joined with the Dutch. A large group officially joined the Apostolische Kirk instead, and the remainder stayed as an independent community or joined the Catholic Church. Still, it is clear that all remained Christians. Over his life, Sadrach's church brought 20 to 30,000 Javanese into the Christian faith, and most of them were from a Muslim background. Sadra was personally responsible for many of these. A few factors explain his extraordinary success. Perhaps, most crucially, was his insistence that the Javanese could retain their culture while embracing Christianity. This presented a stark contrast to both the Dutch missionaries and Islamic leaders who demanded people become more westernized or more Arabized in order to demonstrate they were a true believer. His followers wore traditional clothing and worshipped in traditional style buildings, with one key difference, a three-tiered roof to symbolize the Trinity. Sadra allowed the use of familiar Muslim terminology and customs and adapted the Shahada. There is no God but God, and Jesus Christ is the Spirit of God. He used his knowledge of Christianity and Islam to better opponents in debates, winning thousands of converts in the process. Although Sadra's community disbanded, his work lived on. This early evangelization of Java primed the reason for what would become the largest Muslim movement to Christ in history, when an estimated 2 million Indonesians converted over a five-year period in the 1960s. That story will be told in a later video, so make sure you are subscribed to my channel. Today, Indonesia is home to 8 to 10 million ex-Muslim Christians, by far the most of anywhere in the world. And it all began in earnest with the conversion of Sadra, one man who made an immeasurable impact on the kingdom of God. Thanks for watching.